All right, you creeps. There's not enough good things I can say about this man. Okay, this man, we have to thank that there's internet horror hosting going on. A legend, over 30 years in the trenches of horror hosting. What else could possibly be said about Count Gordeval, a.k.a. Richard Dysell? Well, what can be said is, use Dick, because that's really my professional name. Oh, okay. <laughs> That's okay. You know, it used to, you know, what happened was Facebook did it to me. I had Count Gord Duvall Facebook page. And evidently a number of years ago, somebody complained that that's not his real name. So they came back at me and they said, well, you got to use your name that's on your birth certificate. And I said, why? He said, because that's the rules. And I, so I started pointing to, you know, all these fictitious names and they go, that's irrelevant. We're talking to you. And they say, basically, we're going to shut you down unless you, yeah. So I had to do, I guess it's a, uh, uh, a celebrity site, something like that, where I could put Count Gordeval, but it's really under Richard Dizel, which I haven't used in 50, 60, 70 years, whatever. <laughs> so okay. Let's go. Go with Dick Dizel. I'm happy with that. Yes, sir. As a matter of fact, here in the state of Florida, I actually have to pay $50 a year to use that name because I never changed it legally. And they have what they call is a fictitious name law here. Never mind. It's a long story. <laughs> wow. Wow. So maybe we should go to the beginning. Usually I ask, did you grow up with a horror host? But I don't. Yes, I did. Okay. Yes. Marvin, who is one of the original horror hosts uh, in 1957. When the shock package came out from uh, Screen Gems Universal. And uh, it was in Chicago and Marvin was a beatnik and he had a curvaceous blonde woman who was his wife. And I have to put it that way because we never saw her face until the last episode. And it was kind of implied that she was, uh, had a beautiful body, but had a disfigured face and she wore a brown paper bag. And it turns out she was actually drop dead gorgeous, but it was a, it was a bit, you know. So I, I grew up with Marvin. So I was aware of the whole horror, horror host phenomenon, at least from one market. That's amazing. So, uh to how horror hosting was maybe in the classic era to how Marvin was, was there much difference? Well, Marvin, Marvin was the classic era. I mean, 1957 is when it all hit. What it, the Screen Gems Universal came out and said to all these VHF, now this, this is two to 13, channels two to 13 here in the US. Uh, they said, um, we're releasing these movies and they're short. So maybe you might want to get someone to host them because if you host it, that way you have more time to sell commercials. And everyone said, wow, what a great idea. So they went to the weatherman, they went to the kid show host, they went to the booth announcer and they said, hey, you're gonna be a horror host. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that's where most of them came about. Um, not, not all of them, some actually hired professional people, uh, actors, but most of the time it was in-house folks. And uh, that's how they came about. Now that lasted from about 1957 to uh, in the mid 60s. But by that point, the uh, VHF stations had gotten very rich and they didn't need to do local production. They could just buy the syndicated packages from Hollywood and put them on the air. And it was real easy and actually it was cheaper. So horror hosting kind of went away until the uh, FCC here in the U.S. said, we're going to open up a whole bunch of spectrum here. It's called the UHF band. And we're going to have all these stations come on. And sure enough, all these stations came on. And guess what? They didn't have a lot of money. They couldn't compete to buy the product from Hollywood. So they're back. Boy, it wasn't 57. And they're saying, well, let's see. We can buy cheap, low-budget horror movies. Hmm. Weatherman. Well, a person, sports guy, booth announcer, and bingo, that's the second wave of horror hosts. That lasted to the 80s, 
then UHF stations got rich and the horror host moved to cable access because cable access was available. By law, you had to have a local channel. And uh, that lasted and until 98 when yours truly comes along and says, here's this new thing called the internet. Al Gore called me up and said, hey, Dick, I just invented <laughs> this thing, you know, and uh, what do you want to think? Oh, all right, let's do it. Uh, fortunately, when I uh, created the character uh, in Washington, D.C., I managed to make sure that I had in writing that I owned the character and all the, uh, uh, what you call it, uh, the um, intellectual property rights to uh, the count. So and I said, you know, this thing is has potential. I really could see where, you know, this would go. So I said, let's do this. So I got countgore.com as a domain. And uh, we, we couldn't put it on with hosted movies because it was all dial up. Ding, 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 ding. <laughs> and, you know, basically, you know, you could get text. In 99, we could do so we did all text. So to start with text, text and small, very small pictures. Then in 99, we could do audio. And in late 99, real media came about with little tiny, little tiny video. Uh, and we ran the Flash Gordon serials in, 90, in 99. And then we've been going on up ever since. And right now, I am on that computer and I'm exploring VR, Count Gore, that guy is going to become the virtual reality vampire. As a matter of fact, he is. We've already got a channel. <laughs> that's amazing. That's amazing. And see, that's the thing. You're you're not just. It's not just the longevity. It's that like you're constantly innovating. Yeah, you know where I, I miss something though. I, I really miss the whole Instagram TikTok thing. I mean, I get uh, me and social media just kind of. <laughs> You know, I mean, I do have an Instagram account. I don't do much with it, uh, primarily because it's vertical format and everything I do is widescreen. Um, TikTok is the same thing. I did one TikTok dance uh, uh, back a couple back, I guess it was in, um, in, uh, in December. I put it up there and that was it. Uh, but I'm really, I, I, I don't, I never liked 3D. I, those little funny colored glasses, it was terrible, it gave me a headache. The polarized ones, yeah, it was okay. But you put the big Oculus type virtual reality things on, and suddenly now this is real. This not this is this is like really being there. And then the fact that I can now have access to taking even existing footage and using an AI create a full 3D scene wow. is awesome. I mean, so I'm I'm going nuts. Where where can all your fans? <laughs> expect to see that will there be announcements and whatnot uh i'm i've, I've made it one small announcement um if you have a, if you have an oculus 2 there's a, a, a an app currently in the lab this is where they do the beta testing if you go to the app lab for oculus you'll find something called owl o w l 3d owl 3d and you can it's a it's, it's a free download so the price is right it seems to be very stable. I have yet to have a problem with it. Um, and you can uh, not only watch me, but you can watch a lot of artists are posting stills, uh, some classic, some, uh, some stuff that they've created, and it's really awesome. Um, and then you can do video. And the video right now is limited to 10 minutes. So I've got a bunch of short stuff that I'm doing, putting up there slowly but surely. Um, and... Uh, uh, the only thing you don't have, though, and it's it's tough. They don't have an actual like channel. You can't say this is the Count Gordon Ball channel. If you see what you end up is you click on video and you'll see my picture because I'm I, I'm a, if I'm in it, I see my picture. And then you'll see Count Gore below it. You click on that and that'll bring up all my stuff. Okay. So that's that's how you can kind of create a channel. It's still like you said, it's in beta beta right now. But it's exciting. I, I'm, it I'm is. Just, I haven't been this excited since I invented uh, Gore. Uh, yeah, yeah. Al invented the internet. <laughs> <laughs> so, so all you need is an Oculus, uh, Oculus Two. Yeah, yeah. Okay, that's all you need. 
And I, I'm assuming that they're going to, that maybe it's even available for other platforms. I don't know. I just have an Oculus too. I, I just got it. I've been playing with it, looking around, trying to get a feel for this virtual reality thing. And, um, and then I, you know, doing three, I can't, I, I don't have the capability of doing 360 video because I don't have a, a dungeon that's 360. Right. I mean, it's, it's basically 180, maybe a right. little bit, maybe, maybe 200. But, you know, if you did a 360, you'd turn around and see the camera there. <laughs> I, <laughs> and whatever it, else I have in the background. <laughs> I have to ask this in the spirit of my, my pal slash Cooper, Toby Long. Uh, how 3D will the Vampirella on the top of your coffin be? <laughs> she, because she is a, I hate to say this because it, she doesn't look it, because she is a flat figure. <laughs> <laughs> but I do put I did put up a bunch of what I call pop-ups. Now I was a big fan back in the day of Laugh-In, where they would do these drop-ins, and you know, they'd do and they did some it, and someone would do a bad joke and then da 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 da, da and it go on. Well, I did a bunch of these a number of years ago, and it's me in the coffin. The coffin opens up. I come up. I do a bad joke. Go back in. The coffin lid comes down. And it's shot at a low angle. So it's just perfect for 3D because that lid just comes up and everything is 3D right out to the background. And so I'm, I've, I've converted all of them, uh, or 10 of the 30 some I have converted. Awesome. And uh, it, it's a really amazing. I'm, uh, I have a second channel that, I, that Dick is playing with. Um, I did a recently a tour of uh, a Frank Lloyd Wright property in Pennsylvania called Falling Waters. It's a national, it's an internationally known property. He built, he designed this house actually sitting on, the house is anchored on the actual bedrock on the, on the side of a river. And he then built the house up and cantilevered the entire house over the river and the waterfall. That's why it's called Falling Waters. Wow. It's a huge, it's an incredible bit of, kind of almost good engineering. <laughs> they have had some problems over the years, but it's it's an incredible thing. And I, so I, I, I took the video and I converted it and to see all these cantilevered uh, platforms out from this house and the water, wow. oh, it's just beautiful. And that is up on my channel. I'm about ready to take some, um, what do you call it? GoPro footage that I took of, uh, I have an American flyer uh, model train that I put up every Christmas and I put it on the floor and I have the, so the train coming by with all the cars and going, I'm going to put that up. Wow. Now. So. You're, now you've, you're going to make me poor because now I'm going to buy an Oculus too. Seriously. Well, I'll tell you what, they just raised the price on this sucker. And then I, I think it's a, it's a shame. Uh, and I think I would hold off. Okay. Because they're going to, I, I think they, they were going to realize that they made a terrible mistake. Okay. Uh, I mean, they for no reason, with no improvements, they just bumped it a hundred bucks. And I, I what the, they're not even putting putting any like, all right, we're gonna put a great game in. Nope, just raised. Now that yeah. being said, Apple is, is speculating that their VR system is gonna be like fifteen hundred bucks. Okay. And PlayStation is about four hundred, but you need a PlayStation to run it because it's plugged in. Now the Oculus that is, is all included, so you don't have to put plugged in. Although some people do plug it into a wall outlet. Me, I'll be honest with you, after about two hours, I want this off my face. Yes. I, mean, <laughs> I feel, I'm beginning to feel a little bit like, you know, after about two hours, I'm feeling like the guy from Alien with this thing <laughs> stuck <laughs> Can you remember the first uh, monster horror related movie that you saw as a young, young Dicell? No, I don't. But it, it, it had to be one of the big three. It was either Dracula, Frankenstein or the, or the Wolfman. Uh, I'm guessing it was probably Frankenstein, um, maybe The Bride of. And then it was again on Shock Theater. And I, you know, that was kind of tough to watch because I was too young. My parents said I was too young to watch horror movies. 
<laughs> so I would, I would, I would have to go down, and that's when days when your tuner went click, 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 yes. click. Yes. So I would have to go down with a pillow, put it on top of a tuner, stick my hand right there, <laughs> and then turn the volume. Then I had to stick my my head as close to the speaker and still look up and see that it, it was very awkward. Uh, but it was probably it was probably one of the universals. Um, I'll be honest with you. I, I, while I enjoyed them, uh, I grew up watching a lot of the uh, sci-fi horror, uh, the big bug movies, uh, Tarantula, and uh, uh, well, it came from outer space. That was one of my favorites. Uh, yeah, uh, Forbidden Planet. I, I was, I was really, and I guess I still am into uh, into sci-fi a lot. Uh, uh, I build model rockets as a hobby and have been since I was a teenager. Uh, I'm still looking for a place to fly him down here. <laughs> uh, um, but I mean, there, there is a place up here called Cape Canaveral, but they won't let me fly up there. <laughs> but that's, oh, I just saw that they're going to, you know, the um, NASA is going to launch Monday this moon rocket called the Artemis. And I just saw that our, the Oculus is going to cover it in 3D. Oh wow! I so I bookmarked my. I'm going to have my my headset on watching it, and as a backup, because I know NASA will be streaming it. I'll be streaming it on my big screen TV just in case there's a problem. I can go back to it. Man alive! That will be amazing. Wow. Yeah, I'm looking forward. I'm looking forward to it. But let's go back to horror because, and I, I'm going to tell you something about horror. It, it's it's strange because I don't know how it is in, in Down Under, but I've had experiences back here, not recently, but back early 2000s, late 90s, the count would show up at a convention that was primarily science fiction. I actually had people tell me to go home, to get the hell out of, my, out of this convention because this is not a horror convention, this is science fiction. And I go then, I just couldn't understand this i'm going and you know people i won't answer the question what's your favorite horror movie because if i do that they're going to say that's not horror it's science fiction i so i always say my favorite scary movie is alien it always has been i mean that really you can't, now how can you say that is not a horror movie come on right. but it, it is science fiction also because it's set in space so how can you differentiate True. True. I can't believe so, people would say that to, to oh, say. Yeah. yeah, I don't understand it either. You know, it's it, it just it doesn't make a lot of sense. Uh, sure, you can have you can have uh, <laughs> you can have I mean, you can have all your exorcism movies, and you can have all. I mean, it, an exorcism movie is, now is that a religious movie? Right, <laughs> right. <laughs> My favorite religious movie is The Exorcist. <laughs> You may think it's the Ten Commandments, but for me, <laughs> it's the end of this. <laughs> I'm going to have to use that. I like that. That's a good one. That's a good one. <laughs> I'm working uh, up a whole new monologue here. This is good. <laughs> <laughs> Don't mind me. I'm just hanging around, waiting for the commercials to end. I'm wondering, because I grew up in the States, and I grew up in Norfolk, Virginia. Okay. That would explain Dr. Medblood. And is it possible that I watch? Were you the bozo I was watching as a kid, possibly? Well, wait, because all you boys and girls, it's your old pal bozo. <laughs> of course it was. <laughs> but that blows my mind. I can't believe that you were, because I, I was all about bozo when I was a, a teeter totter. Uh, Bo bozo is what got me into being in front of the TV camera. Uh, I was working for a radio station in Paducah, Kentucky as a rock jock, and I was having a great time. I was just out of college, long hair, mustache, twisted with the handlebar, wearing nice. wild clothes, and having all these teeny boppa girls just chase me around town. I did, this, this is a rough life. And I was... Um, Doesn't the, sound uh, rough, brother. <laughs> huh? It Doesn't sound yeah. rough. Yeah, well, it could have been potentially... Very deadly. <laughs> I, I go out, I put a long record on, I go out to the water fountain, grab, grab a uh, sip of water. The general manager comes out and says, I want you to interview for Bozo. And I said, 
I don't want to be Bozo. You already have a guy in there. You, Dwayne is going to be Bozo. I don't want anything to do with it. He goes, well, we got this guy here from Larry Harmon Picture Corporation, and they want to, I want to show that we have multiple candidates. So just go in and interview. The guy. Okay, I'll, for you, I'll do it. So I go in. The guy says, okay, you want to be Bozo? And I go, well, not particularly. He said, you like kids? And I go, not particularly. He said, you're going to cut your hair? And I go, nope. Shave your mustache? Absolutely not. He said, all right, this, this isn't going so swell. So I, but I, I met with the guy. So I go back, do my shift, get off the shift. Next thing I know, they're handing me a ticket to go to Dallas for training. <laughs> and I go, what is this? I told you I did everything I could not to do this. He says, well, you're going to go down with Dwayne and whoever does the best job is going to get, get it. And by the way, we're actually going to pay you some more. And I go, well, wait a second. You didn't mention that before. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I, I went to Dallas. I did the training. I won the job, put the show. It was great training because it was. I learned how to produce a TV show from the reality of a situation, not, not out of a book. I had, I had studied radio and television in college. I had worked at a TV station. I would worked at a radio station. Uh, I was awesome on audio, but I never was in front of the camera. And, uh, but I learned and, uh, and it was good. I learned to put the white makeup on that turned out to be the vampire makeup eventually. So anyway, all that aside, yeah, that was me doing Bozo. And then, uh, then I was doing, Bo I was planning, they had hired us. So I was going to continue doing the radio show. I was going to do Bozo. They had me doing the 10 o'clock evening news, uh, weekend news. And then they, and we were sitting around two o'clock in the morning one day one night uh, with the general manager and uh, another, one of the other guys at the station. And we're drinking beer and eating pizza and we're watching these movie opens. We have a 16 millimeter projector. We we're going to buy a package of movie opens for the uh, station. And one of them came up, Night of Terror with M.T. Graves. And I took a slug of beer and said, that's what we need, a horror host. And the general manager turned around and said, you're hired. <laughs> I go, what do you mean? Just like he that. Said, he said, I know you have a cape. Well, I did. I was the only guy in town with a cape. My girlfriend made me a cape. And I heard that you have a tux, and I did. He said, you're all set. I'll buy you a coffin. You go to figure out what you're going to do. <laughs> wow. So Saturday night, I, I, I started the anchoring the news at 10 o'clock, went to 1020, threw it to sports, ran into the bathroom, got in, put the makeup on as quickly as I could, to get back in the studio by 10.30 to hop in the coffin and come up live. <laughs> it worked. Wow. But that bozo is what got me out of there because I, I was putting in 100-hour weeks and I was burned out. I quit. I said to the people at Bozo, I said, look, I love the show. I can do this someplace else. I want to be in a major market, though. I want to come back. I'm, I was going away for a, to Europe from uh, several months. I had planned, and just I'll give you I'll give you a call when I get back. See if you can find me another job. I waited three days, and they had another job in Washington. We had negotiated three weeks off for me to get my breath and back in Washington. Did Bozo, then did Captain Twenty, then I talked him into doing the Count. There you go. And that first, you know, running and changing and then going live, was that, are you the type of person that it just felt natural or did you feel the pressure of that? Because it would, it would drive me insane. Well, there was pressure at the time. I mean, I'm, I'm a very, <laughs> one of my clients once told me I'm the most uh, anal person they've ever met. I'm very meticulous and, and right. certain things. And time is one of those. I, go, I learned in broad, broadcasting, always started straight up, as they say. Okay, so always be on time or a little early. Um, and so, yeah, I was always under pressure for, the, uh, for that. But my biggest problem was trying to figure out what to do because I, I had no training in being an actor uh, or so forth. And I eventually learned that I was pretty good at um, improv. I found that out 30 years later when I took my first acting course. <laughs> <laughs> so you know anyway yeah i was bozo so that answers your question in a very long answer uh 
And I loved your show, by the way. It was a, I always wanted to be in the audience, and it never happened. And I wanted to be in the audience so bad. Well, you know, that was one of the nice things about Bozo is the fact that it did have a studio audience. Yes, sir. And kids could be on. And it was always very funny. And I never understood the, the rationale behind uh, management. They put the show on at 2.30. Kids were still in school. Yeah. So, but the audience, you had to be 6 to 12 to be on the show, which means you're going to be in school to watch it. So what happens at 2.30? We have this big bump in the ratings. Parents took the kids out of school to watch the show. Then three o'clock rolls around, the ratings fall off because they're not watching Bugs Bunny or whoever was on next. And I kept going to the management. I said, why are you doing this? You know, you look at the, look at the, you, know, you can read the numbers as well as I can. Well, no, no, live shows can't compete against the, uh, cartoons. Oh, uh, that's not what the numbers say. Okay. Uh, I never did understand that because it always appeal, appeared to me that you put a, a, put a person, have a live studio audience. That person, siblings, parents, grandparents, uncles, cousins, they're all going to watch. Yes. Because it's still a big deal. And I think it still is a big deal to be on television, even though you, have, you can be on Instagram and TikTok and all that. But still, to be on a broadcast station, I'm on a real television show, that's why NBC still does it on their Today Show, where they put the people out, they stand outside in the snow, rain, whatever, just so they can get there. If I can just mention, because you mentioned improv, one of the funniest things I've ever seen is it's a small clip of you and the bone jangler. And he ends up, by the end of it, he's just got you, he, he's got you just laughing. And I have to say, I called in, I never got my free turban. I'm I'm waiting for my free turban. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> You're getting a long wait. <laughs> you know, it turns out, you know, like I said, in the early, early 2000s, I ended up going to a community college because I had some time on my hands. So I said, oh, I'm going to take some acting courses. I, I actually want to do some stage work. And uh, that's when I found out that you know, I'm kind of uninhibited. I mean, I'm, I'm willing to, to stick my neck out. I have been doing this for a long time. And if given a, a cue, something to work with, I can usually come up with something. If I'm working with someone who's, uh, there's a couple of people, the bone jangler was one, uh, John Dimes, who's Dr. Sarcophagi out of the Washington DC area. We get, we get together like that. And it's like, <clears throat> forget it. No one's going to, no one within 50 feet is going to be not on the floor laughing. I mean, it just, it, it's just incredible. And it just comes so easy. Uh, I never, I never had ended, ended up doing any stage work because I never passed the auditions. Amazingly. Uh, and I say that because it was never because I was never a good actor. It was always because, oh, we, this is the role we're going to have you audition for. And oh, by the way, you're great, but we only have one costume that'll fit someone five six, and you're six two. And you didn't tell me this before I auditioned. You right. see me walking in. <laughs> right. So I, I ended up in a bunch of situations like that. Another one, I went in, and I, I just nailed it. I mean, I, there was no question. I had I had this nailed. This in comes this guy. You, the, the auditions are almost over. I mean, I was the last guy. He goes, he talks to, hey, personal friends of the directories. Hey, yeah, I haven't seen you since the last time you did this role a couple of years ago. Yeah, you're hired. Okay. At that point, I said, you know what? It's not worth it. So I just go back to the internet, do my own thing. <clears throat> Lovely king, isn't it? Looks just like the one that uh, was in the wolf, man. How the transition to the DC area and because you mentioned Captain 20. Are you okay to talk about that? Oh, sure. Uh, Captain 20 was, I did not like Captain 20 initially, um, but I was there to do Bozo. I was focused on Bozo. I had, I had, they had done it. They had a Bozo show. It was totally unsuccessful. 
I had watched a couple clips of it. They didn't want me to see that, but I because they didn't want me to uh, compare against it. I, I I just needed to see what why it failed. And I, okay, fine. I don't have. So it took us about two months to to come up with a, uh, a format for the show. It was really simple. We had a half hour. It had to be taped. Uh, we had to tape it on one day. So we, we were having, having to tape on Saturdays, three shows in the morning, two shows in the afternoon. I said, oh, the only thing we could really do was turn it into a kid's game show. And um, that made a lot of sense because I didn't have any side characters. I did, we, we, we did, we did some pre-recorded skit material, but we didn't use a whole lot of it because eventually we figured out that the games were more popular. Kids wanted to win, right? Give me something, give me. We gave him lots of stuff and it, it worked out pretty good. Um, but then we got the, got the show on the air in the summertime. And then uh, in the fall, they, they said, well, we're going to do Captain 20. Well, I knew they had this other character, Captain 20. It actually had two Captain 20s before me. And the, he, they were Earth astronauts. They were, uh, they were riding the coattails of the moon program. And they were in uh, spacesuits and all the rest of the stuff. And, uh, and, but Captain 20 didn't have a show. Captain 20 was a promotion character all he did was he dropped in at the end of a show hey kids i'm glad you enjoyed bugs buddy and friends we have marine boy coming up next stay tuned and that's all i did and then occasionally we run contests on the air uh the previous captain 20 had done gerbil races we did monkey races eventually we got rid of the races and went with a club card that had serial numbers on it and gave away lots of good stuff the first contest was Christmas in Disney World. And I got to go. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> I said, Chris, they said, where do you wait Christmas in Disney World? And I said, with Captain 20, right? Well, I go, right. Mark. You did say right. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so I got, to, I got to spend Christmas in Disney World. That was kind of cool. I am the Count Gordy Vald, host of Creature Feature, the weekly web program at www.countgordy.com. So I didn't like it initially, but I'll be honest with you. Um, after the after we got the Disney thing going the, and the club card thing going, uh, I was noticing the fact that this was in the mid '70s, getting towards the end of the decade, and we were getting a lot of flack about violence in children's television. And let's face it, these cartoon shows were real violent. I mean, Ultraman. Yeah. Uh, uh, so. Uh, I kept thinking, you know, Bozo can only go educational so far, and then he stops being a clown. And if he's not a clown, then what do we need a clown for? And I kept looking at the money the station was paying Larry Harmon for the rights to the show. And I said, if I had that money as a budget, I could come up with a better show locally. So I went to the general manager. I said, let's cancel Bozo. You give me the money that you're paying Larry Harmon as a budget and I'll create kept a show for Captain 20. And he said, great. And they canceled Bozo and they didn't give me a budget. <laughs> he said, Dick, creative people don't need budgets. <laughs> I proved him right. I didn't. <laughs> that was okay. Uh, so yeah, and uh, uh, so Captain Ca Captain Twenty succeeded Bozo. Meanwhile, the Count they didn't want to do the Count. I had a fight tooth and nail to do the Count. They had I didn't know this. I didn't find this out until a couple of years ago that there was a guy on that station doing horror hosting, and I didn't know it. And none of my crew mentioned it. And they had been working on the show. And they were under strict orders not to mention it to me. He wasn't very good. There was, he didn't last very long. So I did, and then they had Sir Graves Gasly, who was out of Detroit. He would come down and do it on Channel 9. And that didn't last very long. So evidently they felt that they didn't, it wasn't going to be successful. So I, but I said, look, you got me doing all this kid stuff. I'm going to talk dirty to adults at night. <laughs> okay. I said, you've got, you've got 1800 horror movies, horror and science fiction movies in your library. And we can do, have fun with this. So I did a pilot 
they said, okay, go with it. We had to come up with the name. At, at that point, I had been going under the moniker of M M.T. Graves. And uh, so I, I, I didn't have anything in mind. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm agnostic on this. I don't particularly care. What, what name do you want me to use? The general manager says, we need a, need a name with some gore in it. I said, okay, how about Count Gore? He goes, I like that, but it's got to be something more. I go, what more do you, I was so frustrated. I turned around, looked at the wall, then turned around again and said, how about something off the wall? Count Gore Duvall. And he stopped and said, Gore Duvall. I like that. We'll use that. Now, where did that come from? People think that I was ripping off on, on Gore Vidal, the writer. Well, I was aware of that he, there was a writer in Washington who did not have a sense of humor. <laughs> and there was a copy of a Gore Vidal book on the general manager's desk. I remember seeing it on my way out. But more likely it came up from the fact that every day driving to the station, I drove past the Duvall funeral home. Big son. So, and by the way, the Duval funeral homes are still there. They make they bury a lot of people every year. Wow, wow! So that that's how the name came about. And I immediately left the office, wrote up a letter, and had him sign it, uh, uh, telling me that I owned everything that I did. Boy, that was I smart. George, I beat George Lucas to doing that. <laughs> <laughs> that was that was really smart to do that. I guess. Sometimes I guess it's insp inspiration because you don't always know it's going to carry on for so long. I, no one knew. I mean, I didn't know. I mean, I was, when we went on the air, we hit big. That first year we were on the air, we beat out Saturday Night Live. That's Bottom, impressive. Not even close. Second year, they just took off that whole first crew was just so good. It wasn't, it was not even contest anymore, but we did the first year we did good. And we, we, we managed to stay on uh, most of the time for 15 years. And uh, then they had, we we're on the second ownership change and they just shut the studios down and said, we don't need to do any uh, more local programming. And they go, hi. Well, you know, it's really, it's really simple. And I saw this happening back in, yeah, it was happening in the, uh, in the mid eighties. And that is, don't forget, you're in, they're in the money, they're in the money, they're in the market to make money. They're in business to make money. You make money by selling commercial time. Your salespeople are the people who make the money for the station. The people who do the programming, that's the product. But the salesmen are the ones that bring in the money. By the mid 80s, no one in the sales department but one person knew what programs were actually on the air. They had the, we still, we had with the first computer readouts, we had the demographics, they were selling demographic numbers and it's still demographic numbers. What program it is, is irrelevant. You want, you want women 18 to 39, boom. What show, what show has a good demographic like that? That's how they buy programmings. Well, yeah, this will do good. Okay, well, we want this to buy, this will be our audience. So we had only one guy in the sales department who even attempted to sell the showcase, the creature feature. And he did okay, but he could make more money just selling demographics and it's much easier because wow. the people who were buying it understood that. And I'll tell you something about parenthood. It's heredity, hereditary, that too. Wow. Although I wonder now, I, I don't know how the how I honestly don't know how they sell streaming stuff. So, I mean, or how they sell the stuff on my phone every time. Oh, here's a headline. I read the headline and 43 ads later, I get the second line. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes. But, That's uh, true. Yeah. So I, but I agree with you. I agree with you. People, it's incredible how many people come out to my live events when I'm in the Washington area and uh, they, they're there because they're loyal to the station that doesn't exist anymore as we as they know it. I don't know. Now, speaking about that, 
I guess it was about four years, four or five years, four or five years, this is 22, five, maybe about four or five years ago, I was down under visiting the schlocky horror picture show in Sydney. Okay. Uh, uh, they, were, they, were, they were on, uh, I got to know them, uh, they were streaming uh, on, the, on the internet. And uh, oh, I, I'm, I'm having, I should have looked this up. I, uh, but I was, one guy in particular who has since passed, I was, was responsible for that. Uh, they had a show that was hosted by a skeleton. And uh, it, was, it was really creative. And uh, I knew I was going to be come doing a tour down under. And I said, well, I want to meet with you. So we, we went to a pub. <laughs> of course, we went to a pub. <laughs> We're going to Australia. We're going to go to a pub. <laughs> <laughs> And we're going to have Australian food. I think it's called beer. Uh, yep. <laughs> and we had a we had a good time. I think it's still on the air. And I know the Schlocky movie was actually the character whose name I can't remember was actually inducted into the Horror Host Hall of Fame. So the Australia is represented in the Horror Host Hall of Fame. Now, see, I knew I didn't know any of this. See, far out. How did you How did you like Australia? I'm just curious. Uh, I loved Australia. Uh, the scantily clad young ladies up in, in, in Cannes up there, you know, were doing some scuba diving. I mean, wow. No, <laughs> I'll tell you, you know what impressed me about Australia? Uh, I mean, the architecture in Sydney was great. Um, the people are incredibly friendly. Um, and even the airline. We were flying from Adelaide to Alice Springs. So we were flying on one of these two engine high wing uh, planes. Very nice turboprop, okay? And I tend to sleep on planes. I, the, the, just the drone puts me to sleep. And it was morning, so not early morning. But So we get into the airport in Adelaide. First of all, there's no, no security. It's like, it's like the old days. Okay, you get up there, there's a door, go out there to the plane. Okay, I can do this. Yeah. So I get on the plane. And uh, I guess it was late morning because they were serving a lunch and it was not that long a flight. So I was kind of surprised they were serving a lunch, but I slept through it. So uh, the plane lands and they were shaking me, <laughs> wake me up. <laughs> and the, it was the flight attendant says, she says, I'm so, and she was very serious about it. She says, I'm so sorry you missed the lunch service. And I said, that's okay. I said, I needed the sleep, obviously, uh, you know, but I appreciate it. Thank you very much. She says, no, I said, you missed that. You missed it. And here, have a bottle of wine to take with you. Wow. <laughs> and I go, sure. <laughs> I mean, one of the reasons why we were in Australia and New Zealand both was to go to the winery. <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> Welcome back to the Channel 20 Club Show. I'm Captain 20. We have two of our space cadets right here. My favorite clip that I've ever seen of your show uh, was the, the one where you had Forey Ackerman on. Mm. Because you two, it was as if, I don't know if you had worked together before, but it seemed, it was so natural and the, the banter back and forth and the, and the little, little uh, quips, I guess you could say. It was just a delight from start to finish. Okay, now can I tell you the dirty little secret on that one? Okay. I was totally unprepared for it. I had a session planned and at the last minute, a fan of mine, a friend of mine who was also a fan came up and says, guess who's in town? Forey Ackerman, he's out in the car. Would you like to have him on your show? I go, who's he? Oh my goodness. I had no, I, I, I had no idea who Forey Ackerman was. And she says, here, poof, gave me some Famous Monster Magazine, she said, you've got 10 minutes to page through them and figure out what you're going to do. And she brings me in. <laughs> and I'm going. So I tell, I tell my director, I said, you know that format I gave you? Throw it away. <laughs> so what are we doing? I said, just follow my lead. You know, and we had our camera crew. We had a great crew. We had three cameras. We had two cameras on the floor and one on a boom. Uh, and I, I'm crane up here, 
and the, it, we, they, they were good. And we had a good floor person who was always, you know, and the good direct and, and good audio people. That was important because they always would throw in appropriate sound effects. Um, but uh, so for I, I, I meet Fori. Oh, so you're the creator of Famous Monster. I had heard of it, but I didn't read it. Um, and uh, so he, he, he was what made that interview good because he very soon realized that I had no idea who he was. But it taught me something. When you're interviewing someone, it's not important that you, you know what they do or who they are. You have to know enough to get them to start talking about themselves. Because you're doing that to me. I mean, you say, you open it up and I'm just gonna run with it because I'm not a narcissist, narcissist, but you know, I mean, if you're giving me the opportunity to talk, I've got stories to tell. And Forey had stories to tell. I mean, I didn't know, he points to my coffin, he sees Vampirella in the coffin. I didn't know who Vampirella was. I mean, someone sent that poster to me and I just put it up in the top of the coffin. So I now he gets on, he tells me about it. It's a great story, okay. So, but I always felt terribly guilty about doing that, those seven segments, about not knowing who he was. And every time I would see him at a convention, I would kind of shy away. I felt a little bit like I cheated him because I didn't know who he was. And I regret that. It was, it's, it's, a, it's, I have that. It's something about inside of me that, that was like that. It just, but he was a wonderful, wonderful guy. I mean, he was just very generous with his time. And, um, and I said, he made that, he made that interview. Well, it was a pleasure to watch the whole thing. And well, I'm uh, glad to hear it. <laughs> yes, sir. It really was. Because uh, you guys go back and forth and it's, I, I thought you guys must have known each other. Yeah, that was the first time I met him. And it was like, like I said, we had about five minutes before we actually he came in the studio. We chatted just a, real quickly uh, and I set things up as, you know, I'm still trying to, you know, basically set up the whole thing and yeah, it worked, you know, but uh, I'm glad you liked it. You know, <laughs> it, you know, I, I, I do, I, I've watched it since then. And it, he does, he does a marvelous job. I wish, I wish I would have treated him differently afterwards and, and maybe have gotten to know him more. Of course, by that time, he, by the time I got to see him on the convention scene, he was, he had deteriorated significantly. He, uh, he, he was coming down with dementia and, right. uh, yeah, it was, uh, it was not a, I don't deal with, I don't deal with pain, agony, and stuff like that. Other people go, I don't know how to react to that. I mean, Same. So. Tonight, we've got Dracula versus Frankenstein. And what can I say, except let's get to tonight's movie. I guess the DC area, it's a major market. So you mentioned the number of films the station had, but was there ever one that you just said, I'm not showing that? No, I didn't have, I didn't have the opportunity. I didn't, I didn't uh, have the opportunity to pick the movies. The, the movies were bought in big packages for a specific amount of times. You could, some of them had a limited number of runs per movie, like, this package has, has 20 films in it. You can run each three times. Some of them had unlimited runs. Uh, it just really depended on the package. A lot of times what would happen is the package was going to expire and they would say, well, let's use all these. If we haven't shown them, we'll show them now. Or if we have shown them and they're good, let's show them again while we still have them and prevent someone else from buying them and showing them. So. Uh, I, I was handed a list of films uh, about a week before we went into session. We did four, uh, four weeks at a time. And uh, so they would give me four titles. Uh, this is a time when there was no VCRs, no videotape uh, recorders. So we couldn't, I couldn't screen the films. I just had to go. We had a, a big, big book, uh, just page after page of two or three line sentences of what the film was about. Some of them I knew, I mean, some of the classics, I know the classics, but some of the, some of the lesser known ones, I, oh, what's this? Uh, so, which is why I, I, a lot of times I never really dealt with the movie so much. Uh, I would sometimes play off, and I still do this, I sometimes play off the title 
sometimes the subject of the movie. Uh, sometimes I'll ignore the movie entirely. <laughs> if, now, it, it, because we we're doing it a week at a time, we could, we could be topical. And I did a lot of politics back in D.C. because you can make fun of the president. Well, you used to be able to do that. Right. Um, and no one threatened to kill you. Um, yeah, and we, we, we would have, we'd have some fun playing with politics. Um, and, uh, but it was most of the times we, for example, I'll give you one example. <clears throat> We're showing a movie. This was not a great movie. Terra of Mecha Godzilla. I had never heard of it. You know, you got this robot Godzilla. I, I, I'm trying to picture this thing, you know, and, and there's no pictures. I don't have no pictures. So, okay. Terra Mecha Godzilla. What can I do? And, you know, and we had just been on a, a short, we had been off the air for a little while while they were showing uh, football reruns, uh, the Redkins, Redskins on Saturday night. We were coming <laughs> back. <sighs> I remember that. I remember that. And uh, we, were, we were coming back and having to start the audience all over again. So I'm, so I'm over there going, so what can I do? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of pissed off that we're having, you know, got this crappy movie, you know, and, so, so we I sent one of the guy, crew members over to the the uh, dollar store or whatever it was, that dime store, or whatever. And I said, "Give me a little wind-up monster toy." So I said, "I said to my uh, floor man, I said, set up a little chroma key over there." And I said, to "The director, I said, here's what I want you to do." I said, "I'm going to complain. I'm going. I'm going to." But, oh, I also had the crew person go out and get me a frozen turkey. So I'm like, well, here we are showing Terra of Mecha Godzilla. Boy, I'll tell you, I just, I, you know, we're just, just starting. We are oh, just starting to come back and build them all the <laughs> again. And, then, and, and I can't believe my program director would schedule this movie as bad as Terra of Mecha Godzilla. And it, my, what, the Florida person comes in with this frozen turkey and hands it to me. And I'm standing there holding this frozen turkey. So, gee, thank you, Leslie. Isn't the movie a turkey enough? <laughs> <laughs> so I put the turkey on my desk and I said, next thing you know, we're going to have Toho send in Godzilla to get revenge. And in comes this chroma keyed in comes this little wind up. Godzilla looking about as tall as I am. And I'm going, oh, back, back, boy, back. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm going, no, it's really a great movie. I love Terror Mecha Godzilla. And, and then please take him away. And then, then you see a hand comes in, wraps around and pulls cats. That's awesome. I mean, that was just, a, you know, like, what do you do with this thing? You know, I had no idea. <laughs> but it was one of my favorite bits. The world is going crazy. It's being over flooded with apps. For you in the DC area, say Dr. Madblood in, in Norfolk, that bigger area, in the, in the heyday, I guess you would say, were you aware of the impact you were having on people to where like nowadays people who are older will still come to see you and say how much you meant to them. What, were you aware at that time the impact no, you would have? No, no. Uh, I had people telling me, uh, this program director secretary would uh, tell me, she says, Dick, you have no idea how pumped you are at the country club on Saturday night. I said, you're a secretary and you belong to a country club? She says, I get paid well. <laughs> uh, she said, no, there's a bunch of lawyers sitting up there, high price lawyers. They take off their, they, they leave their gray suits on, they take their ties off and they sit at the bar and they get drunk to you. And I'm going, oh, okay, that's pretty good. But no, you, the only, I, I didn't really realize, I got a lot of fan mail and that's when mail actually was male mail. Right. Uh, no female mail, no. And uh, they, uh, so I got a lot of fan mail, but we would run a contest every once in a while and uh, we get a lot of entries. and. And, um, but it was, God, it was like the 10th, no, it was the 13th anniversary show. We finally went out and did, did a personal appearance at a theater. 
And that's when I first realized how popular we were because the line was, <laughs> I couldn't see the end of it. Um, and uh, so then we started doing some, we did two live Halloween parties at a theater. This is the Bethesda Cinnamon Draft House, which was set up for parties. It had tables and chairs and so forth. And you watch, and it had a cool thing, it had a stage. So they had the band up on stage, but it had a hydraulic lift in the floor. And on the lift was a pipe organ. And they would, we put the coffin in front of the pipe or basically behind the organist, so the organist over there, the coffin, and out of the floor would come the pipe organ, the coffin, and we'd have the fog generator. And it was so cool. And I would come up and open the coffin. That, and then we'd have a great party. Everyone got smashed. And it was a fun time. And we show, we'd actually show a movie. I don't remember what we showed. Uh, it's not important. <laughs> we had a band and played pretty decent music, and we did some dancing, and uh, yeah, everyone had a good time. Um, but I know, it, I, I, you know, it was only it's only more recently that we're doing. For the last nine years, we've been doing uh, live hosted films at the American Film Institute in DC three times a year, and the turnout has been amazing. The response to the people has been amazing. Uh, and I'm, I'm really starting now I'm starting like 50 years later, I'm starting to get a handle on, on the impact I had. And I'll say this, I had to make a decision very early in my career and, um, to how I wanted to play this, that the celebrity thing. And I, and I decided that I was going to play it very close to the best, uh, I wasn't going to do anything that was going to be terribly offensive. Uh, gore would be PG-13 rated at the worst. Um, I wasn't going to be involved in any scandals because I, divar I divorced my professional life from my personal life. Right. I kept my family life was over here. It did not go over here. And very rarely would this come over here unless I, maybe I was having a Halloween party at the house. So I kept those separated and it kind of worked out so that there was a lot of longevity there. And I, I didn't offend a lot of people. And that was good because I don't like offending people. I don't like being offended. Yeah. <laughs> it's been a strange road. And like I said, you realize 2023 will be 50 years since the first show, February 3rd, 19, or 1973 was our first show. Congratulations. Congratulations. Thank you. We did a 40 year anniversary at the AFI and that's what started off the live things. And we've been doing it ever since we're going to do next year. We're doing here, ready here 50 years since my first show of Concord de Ball. Next year is also the 20 ready for this. This one is mind boggler 25th anniversary of my becoming the first horror host on the internet. That's amazing. Now that's yeah, this is blows me, blows me away. It's also the fifth anniversary of my Roku channel. So we have 20, 50, 25, and five next year. We're going to be doing a lot of stuff. Uh, we're going to do not three, but four of the AFI events. Uh, I'm hoping to do more conventions next year. With the COVID thing, we haven't been doing a lot of conventions. Um, so uh, I'm hoping that we'll be able to do more conventions in a broader area. Because basically, conventions have been east of the Mississippi. And I want to get out to the west. Uh, the count has never been out west. In November, we're doing one in Texas. Uh, as the, the count will be doing one in Texas, that'll be the first one west. Every Other Day is Halloween is a, excuse me, a feature-length documentary made by Curtis Prather uh, on my career up to that point. It has Bozo Captain 20 in the count but it focuses mainly on the count. Um, and uh, we, it, it premiered in Washington, but we did a um, San Diego Comic-Con premiere and I flew out there with Curtis and Carlos Borloff, uh, Jerry, Jerry Moore, who does his, his cable access uh, horror host in DC. And we went out there and Mr. Lobo actually was with us too. And we went out there for the premiere and we had, so the cow was actually on the floor in Comic I forgot all about that. Yeah. But anyway, we still haven't done a convention there as a guest, you know, yes, sir. featured guest. So, yeah. uh, so anyway, next, next year's gonna be a big year. 
Yes, and sir. And then I'll be after that, I'll decide whether I'm going to hang the cape up or not. So we'll see. And what's amazing is you're still relevant. And can I ask you, how does it feel at, to have so many internet children? Like you started the whole internet horror host and now so many people are doing it. And if I can mention a friend of mine. Sure. Uh, Princeton Vice who met you recently. Oh yes, yes, that, that scares. Yes. yes. Uh, so how does it feel to have like all these children horror hosts? Bobby the monster. Like I feel like a bastard daddy. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Actually, it was so funny because in, in, 80, in 98, 99, and 2000, I was begging. I was begging my other... Conti- that it was, only, it was only in the 90s that I discovered where a lot of these horror hosts were because now you had, the, uh, you had videotape and we could send tapes around and you can see... Uh, what the other horror hosts were doing. And we'd see them occasionally at conventions. And I'd say, you know, cable access is fine, but you're stuck in that county. I mean, you got to get on the web and get out there to the rest of the world. And they couldn't comprehend it because they were not, the internet was still, internet was these little discs that AOL would send out five times a week. And that's all they knew, the internet. And uh, so I, uh, I, I, made the, I made the rash projection in 2000. I said, in 10 years, the majority of entertainment programming will be on the internet. I missed it by 10. Yeah. Now you can't, everything is streaming. Everything is streaming. <laughs> mm-hmm. And it's great. I am amazed. I'm going to say something right here now. We are doing a live Zoom. You are halfway around the world. Not only halfway around the world, but under the world too. Yes. And there is almost no lag, no latency. I am just amazed. It is amazing. And so, so yeah, I, I, I was absolutely right. I picked, I, I guessed right. I, I, I hitched my star to that wagon or my wagon to that star, whatever the case, the, the jackass, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> It was, it was moved with the speed of a jackass in 98. Um, so, uh, yeah, uh, but I, I, I'm, 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 I'm very pleased. I'm very excited. Uh, I never have been a terribly jealous person. I think, you know, hey, you know, if you've got talent, show it. I'll, I'll even promote you. I mean, I don't, it's, a big, it's, it's, a big, it's a big pie. Everyone can have a share of a pie. Um, I've had, I've had my really good run and I just hope other people can have theirs and enjoy as much as I've enjoyed doing my stuff. Uh, Bobby Gamonster, it was a big moment for him. I think it was in Chesapeake where he met you mm-hmm. and he did a little clip with you, but you could just see how proud he was that he was there with Count Gore. Well, and you know, I take that seriously. I mean, Really, I do. Uh, I'm aware that you know, I've been around a long time. And uh, I, like I said, I'm now aware of the impact I've had on people. And uh, yeah, I think that I think it's wonderful. And I, again, I, I treat these people with a lot of respect because they obviously treat me with respect. So hey, and, it works. And like Princeton, Princeton is like the new breed. Yeah. And, and even he was telling me he was so like, I mean, I was intimidated to interview you and he was intimidated to be standing there with you, you know, because I guess the question is, what does it feel like to be a legend? <laughs> I'm a legend in my own mind. <laughs> uh, I don't consider myself a legend. I'm just I'm just a, I'm just an actor. I'm just a, a producer i'm just a guy who uh who's muddling through life the best he can uh i'll tell you uh i never have been too starstruck by by people uh i was star I, my first autograph i'll tell you the story of my first autograph i was growing up in the 50s and um cowboys were huge every there were cowboy movies every cowboy show cowboy this cowboy that and my favorite cowboy was the lone ranger and my and uh, he didn't kill Indians because Indian was his best friend, and uh, he didn't shoot to kill. He shoot shot to disarm people. Uh, I thought these are all good things. 
maybe I was a naive person at the time, but I, I thought that was all very good. And uh, so I was a huge Lone Ranger fan. And uh, my, my parents used to take us on long driving vacations. Uh, Australia is big. Uh, the U.S. is, I think, even bigger, mm -hmm. you know, coast to coast. Uh, we were doing a, uh, a driving trip from Chicago. I grew up in Chicago. And we're driving out to uh, California to, for the opening of a place called Disneyland, whatever that was. Um, we knew what it was because I watched Walt Disney on television. <laughs> I, um, I knew Uncle Walt. <laughs> See that? That's that's the novelist. I'm a big fan of Twenty Thousand Leagues. <laughs> um, all right, so we're driving out west, and we're we were two cars. My 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 parents and my sister in one, and my aunt, uncle, and her two kids in the other. My cousin Bob was four years older. My cousin Cindy was my age. So Cindy and I got along really well. But we're, that's irrelevant. We're driving through Utah. What do you know about? Utah is a great salt lake in the Mormon temple. Okay. Uh, for whatever reason, my dad stopped at this hotel. My dad never stopped at hotels. We, we always stayed at motels. My mother did not like hotels. She didn't want to be trapped in case of a fire. She wanted to have a door that went outside. Fine. But we're at a hotel. And I said, why are we here? He says, don't worry about it. He said, just go over there and sit. I could sit there. I'm looking at the door and I'm looking at the uh, check-in guy. This is one of those. This is one of those little things with the little boxes behind with the keys in it. Oh, this yeah. is so cool. Anyway, so he said, "Now, in a few minutes, or sometime this afternoon, the Lone Ranger is going to walk through that door." I said, "Really?" <laughs> <laughs> yep. He said, "They're filming the first of the feature films out here." near the town they're staying at this hotel so you sit there and when he comes in you go ask for his autograph what's an autograph i do as i'm told i'm sitting there i'm sitting there except i didn't recognize him my oh, dad wow. says that's clayton moore the lone ranger go because he's wearing a sport jacket open collar uh not wearing a mask right no six guns no horse. <laughs> so I go up to him and I introduce myself, stumbling as best I could as a, I don't know how old I was, nine-year-old, something like that, eight-year-old, something like that. And uh, he was so polite, so nice. I mean, he was just, he had just been out in the sun all day working. He probably put in a 12-hour day already. And he just took a couple of minutes and sat, stood there with me. He reached up and grabbed a picture postcard, about that big, put it down, said, what's your name again? He wrote, and he, he autographed it to me and uh, he paid for it. And uh, he said, now I want you to, uh, to go back where you were sitting. In a little while, Tonto's gonna come in and you come up here and say, you know, the Lone Ranger, you know, did this, can you sign it for me too? And he said, and he thanked me and he went off. It was wonderful. I mean, you want to talk about just being starstruck. I mean, uh, I, I didn't know how to deal with this, but I went back and Tonto was easy because he had his headband. <laughs> Tweed jacket, but his headband. Ah. His hair slicked back and a headband. And I go up and, um, he's, and he was, he also is very, very polite. And he, he was uh, very gracious. And he said, oh, I see where the Lone Ranger had signed this. He says, he said, your name again is, I said, it's Richard. And he wrote to Dick. He's wow. the first person ever to call me Dick. Jay Silverheels, Tonto, and, and, and said, and thank me very much. And he went off. And I still have those today. That was my most prized possession in my life. I mean, really. Wow. Uh, and I've, I've, you know, that was my first meeting of a movie star. And I was very impressed because they were marvelous people. And can I say you carry that tradition on because you've been nothing but, but uh, kind to me. Well, you know what? 
I you can blame it on Clayton Moore. <laughs> <laughs> Your fondest memory of all the time of Bozo, Captain 20, being a horror host, what is your most cherished memory? Mm, wow. All right. I almost went back to one when I was on television, but it occurred to me that probably I, I once was said, said, I saw a picture of this moment and I said, if I had died right there, I would have died a happy man. And that was when I came out onto the stage in front of the big screen at the AFI Theater on February 3rd, 2013, for my 40th anniversary. And there were 450 people in that theater there for one reason, one reason alone, that was to see me. They paid <laughs> to see me. <laughs> and, um, and I'm standing there in front of this and I'm just like, and there's pictures of me looking out like this. It's almost like calling a shot, you know, for a home run, whatever. And just to see this, and it was a stitched together picture. So you see the whole thing. And it was like, it was overwhelming. It was just, you could feel the love in the room. And, you know, let's face it, we all want to be loved and or admired. And I felt both that night. So, yeah, that was that was cool. This this may be a little deep, but I am really interested in this. What makes this work? OK, your fan base or say for me, Dr. Madblood, but. I don't believe that character and that person is still so beloved just because of nostalgia, because nostalgia, I don't think can do that much feeling, but is it, is it that we, we felt like we were watching the movie with Count Gore? Is that why the character is so beloved or because it's an interesting phenomenon to me. I've never figured out the horror host phenomenon, to be honest with you, because everyone does it differently. Right. And they, they, they obviously, if they're successful, they build an audience. There's something that audience sees in it. Um, I, I've, I, I've tried to analyze. I mean, I've had almost 50 years to analyze this. You know, yes, why did people watch? I mean, I've tried a lot of different things. I tried humor. I tried being, you know, depending on the movie, being very straight and knowledgeable. Uh, uh, I've, I've tried being slapstick. I, I've, I've, and and I don't know. Maybe I think it has some. The character itself, people have to. Re I think in any entertainment media, media, uh, people have to empathize or with your character in some way, shape, or form. Uh, I can. I can't watch a movie. If I'm, if I'm 10 minutes in the movie and I haven't connected with any of the major characters, it's lost. I'm sorry. I, you know, I'll watch it for, okay, if it's, maybe if it's an action adventure film, I'll watch for the great special or the special effects. But, but I need to connect with, uh, with the person. And if I connect really well with the person, person, then it has a great impact on me and the movie will have a great impact on me. And, um, you know, I don't, I, I'm trying to, I, I don't know. I, I honestly don't. I, I, I wish I did. Uh, I have other horror hosts say, well, you know, what, what's a secret? Yes. Well, the secret is you don't start out being a horror host for fame and profit because you're not going to get either. <laughs> and I think to be honest with you, I'll be, I'll be very honest. With you. I think, I think my, my, my fame is, is dealing with longevity at this point. Uh, the fact that I may, I've kept doing it and I, I, I keep, looking to push it further down so yeah maybe that that's it uh the fact that i do enjoy being with people uh i i uh, i have been with some people some some other performers that really just they don't like their fans i mean right. the fans are a pain uh they, they're there to do their shtick in front of the camera and that's it uh so i i don't you know I don't know. It's 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 tough, it's a tough question to answer. It's an interesting. I, I just find it endlessly interesting because uh, I 
that I don't think nostalgia can make yeah. that connection. I don't think it can. On top of because because your 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 audience, yeah, admittedly, I, I have a moderately old audience when I, especially when I do the personal appearances, but it, it's not necessarily all people my age. Uh, there are people 30 years younger than me that are there. Uh, as a matter of fact, I just had um, uh, Megan Brad, 22 years old. She she's a big fan. She uh, she's a makeup artist. She wants to be a professional makeup artist in the movies. She has the talent to do it. And uh, she I've seen her demonstrating it at Scares That Care over the years. And she self-taught. She wants to go to the Tom Savini School of uh, Makeup. I think she could actually teach there, to be honest with you. I've seen so much of her work. And, uh, but uh, she, she wanted to impress me. She was so impressed with the, she actually did herself up as a female version of the Count. Wow. And she went on stage at the AFI. And when we did scares, she entered the costume contest as the female Count. It was kind of funny though. Uh, she did the makeup beautifully. She had the makeup, she just nailed it. Except she got on stage and I said, well, that's very good, but uh, where's the mustache? <laughs> she looks at me and she says, where's your nose ring? She has a nose ring. I said, okay, touche. Wow. <laughs> So when we later on, she came out with a mustache and handed me a clip on nose ring. <laughs> but I mean, you know, if you can if you can play with your audience and your fans like that, and and you know, have a little make have fun with it. Gosh, I mean, if you're not having fun, why are you doing this? <laughs> That's it. Again, you're, it's not for the money. Trust me. Uh, that, that, that's fine. You know, this, this is, people ask me, you know, I, like I said, I recently um, did a tour of this Frank Lloyd Wright house up in Pennsylvania. I'm a big fan of him as an architect. And one of the uh, people in the tour asked the docent, uh, when did he retire? And she said, the day he died. Ah. And uh, she said, you have to understand. It wasn't, it, it wasn't a job. That was his life. And I'm beginning to feel that way. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, it's, uh, it's, become, it's become more than, uh, obviously, it's been a long time since it's been a job. It's, it's, it's more of a, it's not a way beyond a hobby. But um, it's, it's my life. And, uh, you know, I, people keep saying, well, when are you going to hang the cape up? And occasionally, I just want to say, yeah, I'm, I'm ready. You know, I want, I want to go do do other things. I do travel a lot. Uh, one of the things about being, doing your own, having your own studio and doing it on the internet on your time, uh, actually it's kind of funny because here you go. I mentioned I was down in Australia. I've, I've been literally all over the world. Um, and I keep putting the program up every Saturday night. The, Creature Feature, the weekly web program at countgore.com has been put up onto the servers Saturday, every Saturday night since July 11th, 1998. That's Good. a lot of Saturday nights. Please. And it has been put up on from six different continents. Wow. <laughs> I don't even know where my servers are. <laughs> <laughs> They're on the web. They're on the internet. I just go on. I, I've been on shipboard. I, we were up, oh gosh, we were up in uh, Scandinavia, above the Arctic Circle. And the internet was like, oh, the ship didn't have, the ship lost it because this, this, they were on satellite and the satellite was just too low on the horizon to get through away up there because satellites are all, all over the equator. So, I get off the ship. I said, I got to go put this up. So I run it. There's a coffee shop. All the coffee shops have internet. Nice. So I go in there and I order coffee. Lots of coffee. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and I'm logging in. And this is a slug. I mean, this is like almost dial up. 
it took me almost an hour to get the program up, but I got it up. Nice. So nice. I got it up from uh, Africa, from Europe, from Asia, from Australia, from New Zealand. Um, so I, I, everything but Antarctica. I have not been on that, wow. and I don't like cold. Oh, wow, okay. <laughs> You know, so, I, I, I saw the thing from another world. <laughs> <laughs> can, can I ask the flip of that original question? What has there know, been a, Go ahead, try it. <laughs> I assume you can. <laughs> uh, what, has there been a moment where you just thought, what a, why am I doing this? Like the, the lowest, oh, yeah. lowest moment of the, of the time. Wow, the lowest moment. Or maybe, or maybe the most awkward would be better. Oh, there have been a lot of awkward ones. Um, there have been a lot of funny ones, but uh, the lowest moment, I guess it was, the lowest moment was actually when I realized that we were going to go off the air. Uh, when the new management came in in 1987 and said, hey, folks, I don't need these two studios. We had two beautiful studios. Um, best studios in the city. And they said, we're shutting them down. Uh, and we don't need all these folks. We're going to not do it right away. So for about seven months, I watched friends being fired because they, their jobs disappeared. Now they kept me because I had a severance contract <laughs> severance <Nice. car. laughs> and they wanted to make life miserable so that I would quit. <laughs> I'm no dummy, um, but uh, that, that was that was that was rough. That was rough because you know you had to, you'd say okay. Matter of fact, it was going into the end of April of '87. We were going into the a session and we were taking doing the movies for all of May, and uh, we didn't know if they were actually going to run. So wow. we said, so we said okay, let's do these, and the uh, the last movie. I actually opened up and said, well, here we are. Hey, here we are. Count Cordo de Val here on Creature Feature. We're going to show the invaders from Mars. Uh, you may be watching this. You may not be. <laughs> 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 but you won't know it if you're not. Uh, and, I, it was just, it was, and that was the last show. That, was, that ended up, they, and they, said, they finally relented. They, I came back from lunch. The receptionist gave me a, a pink slip. It said, it said, Duffy wants to see you. He was the program director. I went up there and he said, you waited us out. Here's your check. Wow. <laughs> so thank you. But that, 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 was the, that was probably the roughest time. Um, because you knew the end was there. It was coming. And there's not a damn thing you could do about it. But very early in my career, uh, a guy who I had hired to do some work on our house would see me coming home and I'd be really wound up. And I, 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 was, I was very uptight and uh, there were problems at work and um, it was management problems and uh, there was nothing I could do about it, but I was worried about it. And he'd see me come home and he finally took me aside and said, I, hey, look, I, this is none of my business, but you're coming home just totally wound up so tight. He said, can I give you a little bit of advice? And I go, sure, why not? You know, everyone else is giving me advice. He said, okay, don't worry about things over which you have no control. And he said, it sounds simple, but when you're faced with the problem, look at the problem and be realistic to yourself. Can I personally affect the outcome and he said if you can't personally do it screw it don't worry about it because you can't there's nothing to worry about and it was it's been hard to implement from time to time but it's been the, some of the best advice i've ever gotten and uh yeah you know so once i got past that hurdle and <laughs> the other <laughs> hurdles came up, uh yeah but life's full of those things but if you don't if you can't control it then you know now, if you can control it, at what level can you control it? I mean, you, can, you can't control national policy, but you could control 
your local representative or the people. There are lists. You got to bring it down to a level where you can deal with it. Right. So, yeah. And it's, it's tough, but it's been probably some of the best advice I ever got. It works. Happens every Saturday night at www.countgore.com. Was there ever a time on air where you just got so tickled, you were laughing so much, you just, you couldn't carry on? <laughs> oh, God. Where you just, you couldn't get it together enough to... Not on television, but on the internet program. Again, I had Dr. Sarcophagi on the program. This is the first time we were actually working together. And he was in character and I was in character. We were on my set in my studio and we just, we just, we were in pieces. <laughs> <laughs> it was like, who can break up the other guy the most? And it just went on like that. And it was just, it was just, it was just, you know. <laughs> Are the fans, is there somewhere the fans can see that? You know, we recorded it whether or not I saved it. Oh, gosh. I, you know, I'd have to look for, I mean, look, you have to understand I've got archives. As a matter of fact, I'll tell you what, here, here was a very proud moment. Um, when I left the station, as I said, I, I owned the, uh, the intellectual property rights. And since they were not gonna use the videotape machines anymore, they threw out all the videotape. So I took all the videotape that had me on it. And I had 150 reels of videotape, one inch tape. And I eventually ended up having them transferred to three quarter inch tape. And I had boxes of three quarter inch tape. And uh, sometime in, in after two, after 05, sometime after 05, I get a call from the National Archives. They've got a storage place in Culpeper, Virginia, where they store historic films, historic films and videotape and audio tape, all basically media. It was an old, uh, it was the old um, nuclear shelter for Congress. It, so it, it, it was protected against radiation. It was all, so basically they have, if a, if a film is declared important, a print goes in there. Nice. And they said, we're doing a thing on local television. And you were the last local television entertainment. Yes, I was. Do you have any footage? <laughs> I said, how many hundred hours you want? He said, you're kidding. I said, no, I probably do have about a hundred hours. And I said, here's the deal I'll make you. I, my three quarter inch player died. I will let you have, I will give you all the three quarter inch. You can transfer, you can do anything you want with. Just store it. So in 10,000 years, someone's going to break into this place and they'll be watching Count Gordon. <laughs> or Cap there was some Captain 20 in there too. Wow. Uh, even a little bozo too, but anyway. <clears throat> um, but you've got to transfer it to a different medium. And that time I was using mini DVs. And I, so I, I, I gave them 100 mini DVs and said, transfer all this over. And they did. And I gave them a hard drive and they also put it on MPEG-4 on a hard drive. So I've got all that, I got most of my library on, on, both, on both, both formats. Uh, the back of my show. Will the shows be for sale? Some of them are, but most of them I can't because the movies are not public domain. The stuff on Channel 20 was all, they're very little public domain. We bought those films, we own the rights to them. The rights were there. Uh, the stuff that I put on the internet is all is with the exception of about four or five films that producers have come to me and they say, we'll give you permission to show it because we want exposure. Right. Um, most, all those are public domain. I mean, I've got, I've got 25 films, hosted films right now for sale on the web. 
No, not all on the website. But when we go to conventions, I have 25 films. I probably have maybe 10, 15 films uh, so, on the website. Where can the fans get Count Gore merchandise and other things? Well, the, uh, countgore.com. I mean, that's, uh, that's it. Uh, they go to the marketplace. Oh, I've got something brand new thing. Uh, Count Gore Duvall comes clean. Craft soap. <laughs> oh, nice. <laughs> uh, one of my daughters, I have two very talented, very uh, entrepreneur, entrepreneurial daughters, um, said uh, she's the, Jessica is a very successful scientist. She's our, she's our first doctor in the family. She's a PhD awesome. uh, in, in microbiology. Um, takes after my wife, obviously. She's smart. Um, my other daughter, more like, takes after me, she, but she is smart too. But she's also into the arts, but more graphic thing. Um, anyway, Jessica decided she wanted to get into craft, making craft soaps. She said, Dad, would you like some craft soap? And I said, I, you know me, I don't like fragrances. I, 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 I have a very, I, a very sensitive nose to fragrances. She says, well, what do we make? You pick the fragrance. So we designed a fragrance that worked for me. Nice. And it's, 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 very, uh, it's very outdoorsy. It, as uh, I think she says, it's uh, like fresh cut grass under a shading magnolia next to a freshly dug grave. <laughs> that sounds awesome. <laughs> anyway, so we just put that up there. I just got a new shipment of that in. But yeah, we have we have we have uh, DVDs. We've got T-shirts. We've got personally autographed. Oh, and the T-shirts, by the way, have a place where I can personally autograph them, and I autograph them with a paint pen so it can be washed. Um, we have uh, autographed pictures of a uh, couple varieties. We have the soap. What else? Yeah, that's it. Uh, in November or October, we're going to have uh, every other day is Halloween sold out. <clears throat> we don't have any more copies of that. And that was very popular. And frankly, I think Curtis did a marvelous job of tying it in because it's not just my career, but it ties into the other horror hosts who were then coming out of uh, the uh, cable access and coming onto the internet and doing the, conven to the convention scene and expanding beyond their small markets. Yes, sir. Uh, but we're, we're going to, it's going to be re-released on a Blu-ray. We did uh, last year, we worked on a kind of a follow-up of what hap what's happened since 09. Oh, nice. Um, of course, <clears throat> we may have to do another follow-up in 10 years. You know, I mean, as, as the virtual reality vampire you know? exactly. <laughs> uh, but anyway so that they're going to come and that one will have like the first one did a replica of the channel 20 club card that and uh, that'll be included in the package that'll be coming out in october we're, we're working right now on a 50th anniversary t-shirt um, we have the artwork done on it. Uh, Robert Long II out of Baltimore, a fan and a, a guy I've worked with and known for a long time, did the, he did the 10th anniversary for the web uh, program. And he, so he's doing the 50th for this one. I'm right now working with a, uh, a screen print company to uh, do the t-shirts. But uh, so yeah, all that's at concord.com. We do take uh, PayPal. We do take credit cards through PayPal. We do take now, I will warn people from Australia or any place out of the U.S., even in the U.S., shipping is getting incredibly expensive. Yes, sir. Um, I mean, I try to keep my prices very reasonable. I try to teach, you know, I, I, view my, I do everything as if I were a customer. Yes, sir. So I, but I'm, I mean, I'll give you an example. Um, in the U.S. here, we have a, new postmaster general who I was hoping would be fired real quick. Uh, he keeps raising the rates to send out an eight by 10 black and white glossy is now $6. What? <laughs> Here's what's happened. You know what? Now you, if, I send them out with a piece of cardboard in because I don't want people to fold them up and bend them and you know stick them into. So 
now the post office said, oh, you make it so you, it, it can't be folded. That means we can't run it through our automated machine. So we're going to charge you for a package. So it's now the, the size of an envelope is now a package, even though it's, you know, a little thin. And it, even though it doesn't weigh that much. So you, you just, it gets rate is packaged. So that, that's how that works. So it's like, you know, and they keep, and, and I just got notified that for starting in October, they're going to do a surcharge for Christmas. Wow. <laughs> it's almost like they're trying to get people not to buy things. <laughs> Yeah, I, well, I, I, I think somewhere in the past, this, this postmaster has said he would like to put the post, post office out of business and make it all just let every, commercial companies do it. See uh, this? See that? Nice. My favorite horror related movie. Awesome. Walk awesome. this way. <laughs> you know how I knew I, I tell the story and it's absolutely true. And you, very few people know this. At, I was sitting in the theater when the first came out. And for whatever, remember I said I have this kind of meticulous mind when it comes to like numbers. I'm sitting there and at the open, there's a clock striking in the background. Uh, this long dolly pen shot, okay? I started counting how many times, it, what time it is. I wanna know what time it is. Bang, bang, bang. I knew we were going to have a really fun movie when it struck 13. Okay. At that point, I started looking for what they call, I guess, Easter eggs in the yep. movie. Yep. All the, and it, it is so, so much fun. So it's my, it, that probably is my favorite movie to watch of any genre. Who has, has the baton? Who do you think is going to carry horror hosting for the next 50 years? In your opinion, just your opinion. I don't, it, it, it's someone that you've probably never heard of yet. Uh, uh, someone young, someone who's going to probably in the next 10 years, if they can keep it going, someone maybe someone who's going to maybe uh, take the baton from the most successful syndicated horror host in America right now is Sven Gulli. Right. Uh, he's, he's out. His syndication has lasted longer than Elvira's did. I was never syndicated but I've been around longer than all of them. So that's, yeah. right. uh, I don't, I don't, I don't know. Uh, there's so many, there's a, there's a, there's a resurgence right now of people doing this mainly because of the internet and streaming yes, services and platforms that they can do this. So I don't know. Someone is going to emerge someone who is going to become an inf, inf no beyond influencer. It's going to be a performer who's going to, to grab it and run with it. And the audience is going to empathize, but I have, I don't know. I don't know if I've met the person yet. Gotcha. And maybe I have, maybe I have it at a convention and, okay. and uh, now we're coming out of COVID. Maybe I will meet more of them and have a better handle on it. Yes, but it's, uh, I don't, I honestly don't know. It will not be. <laughs> <laughs> There's new blood on the bay. <laughs> All right. I want to say thank you to Halloween Jack for helping arrange it. And final thought for all your fans. Sure. Uh, you know, don't worry about things over which you have no control. But most of all, as the Count would say, may all your blood be born. <laughs>